Our next speaker is Alphonse Pomp. Dr. Pomp is professor at Cornell, and he'll talk about his three biggest errors in judgment and technique with duodenal switch. Dr. Pomp is also uh, this uh, year the uh, winner for the Clinical Excellence Award at Sages, so uh, he's pretty good. You got me up. So thank you very much. I've never made an error in technique. That's why I won the, no, I'm just. Uh, how come I'm not moving forward here? Green button. All right. So uh, as part of disclosure, I'm, I, uh, I uh, do speak for Covidian and occasionally Gore. And if anybody else wants to me to work for them, just email me and I'd be happy to become there. Let me talk a little bit about uh, biliopancreatic diversion. Uh, it's not a common operation. It is a derivation of the biliopancreatic uh, diversion, uh, first started by Scopanaro, which is essentially a large uh, gastric bypass type operation with an antrectomy and very long limbs. Um, this was modified uh, because of problems with marginal ulcer, diarrhea, excessive flatus, and uh, malnutrition but uh, it is still used uh, with uh, a fair amount of frequency by uh, surgeons, uh, particularly in Italy. These two fellows down on the bottom left, Picard Marceau and to the right, Doug Hess, modified it, and uh, to them we owe essentially the sleeve gastrectomy, which was part of this operation, and then the alimentary limb, the duodenum was preserved. The alimentary limb was given as a uh, function of uh, total body length, and it had some benefits over the biliopancreatic diversion with less dumping or no dumping because of the retention of the pylorus and the decreased incidence of marginal ulcer rates. So uh, essentially this operation uh, has a long alimentary and biliopancreatic limbs. Um, the weight loss is generally not secondary to the uh, uh, restriction component but more to the metabolic component and the length of the common channel really appears proportional to the risk of nutritional deficiencies has a greater weight loss, but a much higher operative risk and more long-term sequelae than the gastric bypass, as the fat-soluble vitamins and protein deficiencies may exist. Michel Gagné was the first one to do this laparoscopically with uh, myself, Dan Heron, uh, Barry and Amnett in uh, Mount Sinai in the late 1990s. And uh, let's just look a little bit about why you would use this operation as, a, as a per se. This is data from S, uh, the Swedish obesity study that goes out now uh, 25 years, but the graphs are essentially the same. And if you look at total body loss, uh, weight loss with the gastric bypass, it stables out at about 30%. But uh, that's for smaller patients. And when you look at patients with a BMI of uh, greater than uh, 50, you see that the gastric bypass does gives you excellent results with less than that, but only good results with respect to weight loss. And this is uh, Vivek Prashant's data out of Chicago that shows that there's a substantial improvement in weight loss and the uh, super obese uh, compared to gastric bypass. Uh, but it's a complicated operation. When you do it in big people, you get into problems. So uh, we've modified this technique to start with a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, wait for an appropriate period of weight loss, and then do the second operation. We've published on this in the Journal of Gastroenteral uh, Gastrointestinal Surgery, showing that the complication and mortality rate is, is virtually uh, is much, much smaller if you do this in two stages and the weight loss persists. And this is not a weight loss that you're gonna get with gastric bypass doing a second stage after sleeve gastrectomy. That's more of a flat curve. So here is the advantages of the two stages. And I think the big advantage is actually that second underline and bolded point that you can observe if the patient is compliant when you do the first stage because you don't wanna do this operation on the second stage. And here are the sort of overall results of the duodenal switch with a 65% uh, excess weight loss that is maintained over term. Um, there are behavioral changes with the diarrhea and the odor. And this sort of leads into my three biggest errors, starting with, uh, I believe, the literature. And the first thing I did was I believed the literature. I read Scopanaro's papers. I read Hess's papers. I read Picard Marceau's papers or the group out of uh, Quebec City. And the common channel with uh, 50 to 100 uh, is just laced with mineral and vitamin deficiencies in my hands and I've increased my length over time. Not only is there deficiencies, but there's also quality of life and operative complications. Here's an article out of the British Journal of Surgery, which is actually a Swedish article, and shows that the severe metabolic effects 
of the duodenal switch are about two out of the 30 patients, so it's about 6%. My rates are much, much higher than this. Here's an article about, uh, from the Quebec group, published a couple of years ago, uh, saying should we use this operation in patients with a BMI of less than 50? Uh, I'm sorry about the small size, but you look at this and there's a very low complication rate, uh, especially those who require surgery. Um, I'm not able to achieve these results and I do not use it as a standard operation for patients with a BMI of less than 50. I don't think it's a good operation for those patients. This is out of the same group, uh, current problems in surgery. And if only 20% of my patients had mild and bloating discomfort, I'd be very happy. It's about twice that. Um, vitamin deficiencies, again, published by the same group uh, over long term. Vitamin A deficiency is about 10 times that in my uh, and vitamin uh, D deficiency is spectacular. Uh, most of my patients are anemic that have this operation. Um, and uh, I don't think this literature is carried out in the American population. This is a Canadian group. Maybe they're more compliant. The second big operation is if you operate on patients with irritable bowel syndromes and you do this operation, you're setting yourself up for a disaster. I ask every patient that I do a do it on switch on, how many bowel movements do you have? And you have to add three or four of them, all of them in the morning. So if these patients don't get up, like to get up early in the morning or have a job to get to or a long morning commute, um, this is not an operation. And once you start operating on these patients, even if you lengthen their limbs, you don't decrease their symptoms. Their bowel movements are definitely dietary dependent. If they have a dietary indiscretion or eat a lot of uh, fat containing foods, ice cream, potato chips, that kind of stuff, they can really get into problems. But the other thing is that they seem to not tolerate very well complex carbohydrates, bread, pasta, rice. And uh, this gives them a lot of problems. Not only do they gain weight with this operation in spite of it, but they get a lot of bloating and discomfort. So patients with that problem, it's an issue. And finally, uh, my third is a common error with this operation is believing patients. And that's why I really firmly believe that this is a better operation. You need to stage this operation so that you can evaluate and follow up. Every patient comes in and swears that they're going to take their vitamins and they're going to be compliant by coming back. And uh, less than half of them do. Uh, you need to have a stable employment um, and a home environment to do this operation. Um, if you lose your insurance, times are hard. The supplements cost about 1500 bucks a year. Um, uh, and uh, if you work in an enclosed space, like if you're a police officer and you're driving around in, uh, in a car with the windows closed, your partner might not like that with this operation and you need to have access to the facilities during the day. So if you work in a toll booth, it might not be a good idea. You might be alone, but when you have to go, you have to go. A couple of other points. The first speaker mentioned there are some bonus points. If your surgery takes more than three hours, you're going to get into problems with these patients, especially the super morbid obese. There seems to be the bewitching hour. And these patients, the three hour ones, are the very android and the BMIs in the 50s. And it can be just if they're barrel chested and barrel bellied or if they're very high. It's important to orient the bowel and measure the bowel. Uh, Dan and I have had a the same idea over time, and it's pretty easy to get it twisted around, a lot easier to get it twisted around when you start and measure the ileum backwards. You've got to close your mesenteric defects. The most important thing is that not any surgeon, especially your colorectal brothers and sisters, uh, know about this operation. And if you do a, get an anal fissure and do a lateral sphincterotomy on these patients, you're going to make them rectally incontinent. And the final thing is don't ever be the one to write the chapters, because then you get referred all these patients because they read about you. Um, but it is part of the surgical armamentarium. We have four nice operations. Picking the right operation for the right patient still remains a huge challenge, and I don't think anybody really has the answers. We all have our algorithms. Uh, but please remember, this is courtesy of Lee Kaplan, when you're talking about the metabolic effects, both the bypass and the switch um, have this duodenal exclusion and enhanced distal nutrient delivery, which really resolves the diabetes well. Um, but the DS has the added advantage of uh, malabsorption with sustained weight loss. Big comparison, you'll have that in your uh, book. But I think the long-term complications of malnutrition requiring revision are higher in the duodenal switch and it's a longer operation. I get this done in about three and a half hours. Uh, Gagne can do it in about two, uh, but it's a very complex operation. So excellent weight loss, resolution of most core morbidities, but uh, the potential for malnutrition requires lifelong monitoring and you really, really, really have to choose your patients well. 
Uh, remember that information and education equals knowledge. Knowledge and uh, experience equals wisdom. So here's my trifecta. You need a motivated, intelligent patient. They all are motivated and intelligent when they come to you because that's why they're having weight loss surgery in the first place. But they need the financial resources in order to spend about 1000 to 1500 bucks a year, even if they're a savvy internet chopper. But most importantly, they need to be compulsive enough to take 12 supplements a day and five divided doses. That's not 60 supplements. That's just... You can't have calcium and iron together. Uh, band is not a good option for these big, big patients, and the gas duodenal results are definitely superior, but there's a cost you pay. I think the stage procedure is the best option because it gives you the chance to evaluate your patients. Thank you very much. <laughs> Did I go fast enough?